will hear a man talking to a receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Good evening, sir. Do you have a reservation? Yes. Let me just check. I've got everything. Um,、uh, sorry. Yes, a reservation. It's in the name of Hartley, Martin Hartley. Let me see. Oh yes, here it is. That's for three nights. Yes, that's right. Do you need my passport? I just need to take the number as a form of ID. No problem. Now, can I just ask you to fill in this registration form, please? Ah, actually, no. You see, I've broken my wrist. Yes, I noticed that. I'm afraid form filling is something I can't manage right now. Not without a lot of pain, anyway. <laughs> oh dear. I'm sorry, sir, but don't worry. I can complete the form for you. That's very kind of you. What do you need to know? Well, let's start with your name, of course. So that's Martin, um. Hartley. That's H A R T L E Y. Thanks. And your address? Forty-five. Carlisle Way. Could you spell Carlisle for me? Sorry. It's C A R L I S L E. You don't pronounce the S. Carlisle Way, and that's in Lewis. L E W E S. And is there a state? I don't think you have states in the UK. No, we have counties. It's East Sussex. Sussex is with double S. The postcode is L W four six A U. Do you want my phone number? Actually, no. We contact people by email now. Ah, yes. And send me lots of advertising too, I suppose. <laughs> My email is hartleynitram at yahoo dot co dot uk. Sorry, a bit slower, please. Hartley, my surname, then Martin backwards n i t r a m. That's all one word. And all lowercase. That's right, no capitals. At yahoo.co.uk. Thank you very much, Mr. Hartley. And could you give me your passport now, please? Thanks. You can have that back now. Ah. And that's for three nights. So checking out on Sunday morning. Uh huh. Okay. You're in room sixteen. That's on the first floor, overlooking the courtyard. Here's your key. Would you like somebody to take your bag? Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. Do you have a map I can take? Yes, of course. We've usually got lots of them here, somewhere. Ah, yes. Here we are. Thanks. Could you show me where we are exactly? Um. Let me have a look. Um. Ah, yes. This is our street here.
Avenida Constitución, the bigger hotels are marked, so let me just see which one is us. Um, here, yes, here. This is Hotel Columbus, just before you get to the museum. I say just before because that's the way most people get here. I mean, coming from the main square where all the buses stop, or from the station. Yes, that's the way the taxi came in from the airport. I thought we drove past the museum, though, just after we went through that big square you mentioned. Ah, you probably mean here. That's actually an art gallery. It's worth having a look round, but the museum's more interesting. I think so, anyway. Thanks for the tip. I hope I get time. Right, well, tomorrow I've got to be at the conference centre. They told me they'd put me in a hotel that wasn't too far away. Oh, yes. The conference centre's not too far at all. Let me see. Uh, yes, down here. You can walk there in seven or eight minutes. Just cross over the road and go straight down this street here. That will take you towards the newer part of the city. Walk on for a couple of blocks, and then when you get here, you just have to go right a very short distance, and then you'll see the conference centre above the other buildings. It's quite big. I see. That all looks quite straightforward. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Have a nice evening, sir. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about young people living on their own. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 12. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 12. Loneliness is something we all suffer from in varying degrees, but young people living on their own can be particularly vulnerable. Many who leave the family home find they are less confident and have more difficulty in finding their feet than they expected. Often, going to work or study in another town or city will be the first time they have lived away from home. Although this may sound like an adventure for those dying to get away from the glare of the parental eye, for others it is a daunting prospect which generates apprehension, uncertainty and even fear. In fact, in a recent survey of over 1,600 people who had recently left home, 32% said that understanding and coping with loneliness was a crucial issue for them and made them feel highly stressed and distracted. An annual report by researchers last year recorded a noticeable increase in the number of individuals with homesickness, transition and isolation issues. Acknowledging that feelings of loneliness and isolation could impede progress at work or study, they examined the number of people using the welfare and health services. They found that young people in particular were prone to difficulties – Last year, 61% of all people using counselling services were aged under 30, and of this group, 57% were men.
Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. Leaving home involves a major change in lifestyle, work patterns and degree of independence. You will be away from home, family and friends and are no longer supported by familiar surroundings. For this reason, in the first year a lot of young people suffer from loneliness. Ironically, this sense of isolation comes at a time when you are likely to be surrounded by people most of the time. Living in a busy city, travelling on crowded buses and trains, you will be constantly among people. But this can sometimes compound your sense of being alone. Seeing others who appear at ease among large crowds, mingling and making friends, can make you feel excluded and inadequate. Adapting to a new environment makes people uncertain of what to do or how to behave and breeds insecurities which can make for a real sense of isolation. It is often those who are more used to being on their own who deal best with the transitional period of leaving home. Other reasons for feeling alone include high expectations of the big city where you have the best time of your life and meet lifelong friends it may be the first time you have had to make new friends since you started primary school and perhaps you are reluctant or finding it hard to replace old friends whom you miss. There are also pressures to juggle work and socialising which may leave you feeling left out or it could be that you have a long distance relationship and feel torn between your new lifestyle and that special person who lives so far away. Because loneliness can leave you with a sense of low self-esteem, where you become self-conscious and feel you have been rejected, it is very difficult to overcome. You may be reluctant to even try and make new friends or take part in social activities and will also find it difficult to say no to things, leaving you feeling exploited and weak. One of the ways of combating loneliness is to remember that it's not your fault and that it's something everyone has to deal with, despite appearances. Counsellors advise those feeling lonely to speak to someone they know about their feelings. They also ask them to consider joining groups and societies and to get involved in activities which interest them as a way of meeting more people. Of course, overdoing it and jamming your schedule with too many things just to avoid being alone will not work but meeting others with common interests may be a step forward. If you still feel like you need someone to talk to, you could try group counselling, where you will be able to talk to and receive support from a small number of people with the same difficulties as you. For more information, or to be put in touch with an individual counsellor, contact the local town hall support services. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students talking about reading. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Milena. How's your research for your assignment going? Which assignment, Josh? The one on sustainable transport. It's due in on Friday. Oh, I've not nearly finished it. I've still got so many articles to get through. 
In fact, I need to read another two books on the reading list before I can even think about writing it up. It doesn't help that I'm a really slow reader. Well, why don't you practice speed reading, just like me? Oh, let me into your secret. If anything, if I don't get a move on, my assignment is going to be late. What exactly is speed reading anyway? Well, speed reading basically means reading faster and more efficiently. It can make such a difference. I've noticed the benefits already, and I've only been doing it a few weeks. Sounds good. What benefits are we talking exactly? Well, the majority of people read at an average rate of two hundred and fifty words a minute. So that means that an average page in a book or document would take you around one or two minutes to read. So up to two minutes a page. That sounds quite fast to me. I reckon I spend at least five minutes on each one. But just think about it. Imagine if you could double that rate to five hundred words a minute. You could zip through all the articles and books in half the time. Another thing is that it can help you understand the basic structure of an idea or an argument much better. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. You make speed reading sound like some kind of sport. Well, actually, speed reading is a bit like playing sport. I like to think it's similar to running. Running? Much too fast for me. I'm more of a jogger. You're not selling it to me very well. Okay, okay, but just think about what it takes to be a fast runner. You can learn the techniques, but to get really good at it and build up your speed, you really need to practice. But athletes train for hours every day. That's true, but your reading speed can improve if you practice a few basic techniques. The first thing to do is to actually find out how fast you're reading at the moment. So, time my current reading speed. But I read so slowly; it will be really depressing to find out just how slow I am. Believe me, timing yourself is a really good idea, and it's so easy to do. There are lots of online speed reading tests. You just enter the words "reading speed test" into Google, and loads will come up. You could also do a reading comprehension test and see how well you understand what you're reading. I don't know, but remember to read at your normal speed and time yourself on a few different pages. The average of your times should indicate your average reading speed. What do I do next? Well, the next thing to do, and this is really important, is to get rid of distractions. I used to think that music in the background while I was reading was a good thing, but it wasn't for me. I found I increased my speed by working without any noise whatsoever. I usually read in the library, but there always seem to be people talking around me. Well, try using earplugs to block out all the distractions. Another important thing is to set yourself targets. Basically, if you know what your goal is, you're more likely to achieve it. My goal? Well, that's easy. I need to find out about the problems of accessible transport in Africa, and then think about some solutions. I know what I need to do, but I keep skipping back to a sentence I've just read, and at other times I go back a few pages just to make sure that I've read something right. I know what you mean. Actually, a lot of people do that when they read. They reread material when they don't actually need to. It's called regression, and it's important to get out of the habit of doing it. You can reduce the number of times your eyes skip back by running your finger or a pencil along each line you read. Your eyes will follow the tip of your finger, and this helps you avoid skipping back. Why not give it a try? Yes, I think I'll give it a go. But I suppose the first thing to do is find out what my reading speed is. What a thought! That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four section, you will hear an introductory lecture to a course on Southeast Asia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My name is Paul Stange. I'm coordinator of this course. It's called Southeast Asian Traditions. I'm also the author of the study guide and the course reader, and you should have those in front of you. As well as these, you'll need two textbooks for the course. There's the one by Osborne, and there's another by Legg. I'll talk a bit more about the reading materials in a moment. Now, if you haven't got these materials, you can buy the textbooks at the university bookshop, and you can collect the study guide and the course reader from me on your way out of the lecture. The purpose of this lecture is simply orientation. What I'm going to do is introduce myself, talk you through the course, and give you some additional advice, apart from what's contained in the study guide, on dealing with the various assignments for the course. First of all, the materials. You'll find the two textbooks very clear, and they give a good basic coverage of the history of the region. Most of the reading materials in the reader are fairly easy going, but I have to warn you that two of them are quite difficult. These are the readings by Smale and Bender. And of these two, the one by Bender is perhaps the more challenging. But don't let that put you off, because understanding these two readings is important to help you develop a clearer understanding of the cultures. In other words, they'll help you acquire greater sensitivity to the differences between the various cultures in the region. Now, the course itself. The course has multiple aims. It's primarily a history course, but it's not only a history course. It is, in most respects, a cultural history course focusing on Southeast Asia. Nevertheless, the course is, as you'll see from the materials, an introduction to the Southeast Asian Studies component of the Asian Studies program. In looking at the cultural history of Southeast Asia, there are two major influences to be considered, the Chinese and the Indian. It's important not to forget the extensive influence that these two countries have had in the region. China has been trading throughout the region since at least the 6th century, so many of its cultural and social traditions have influenced the countries in the area, and religious practices from India have helped form today's culture. So we'll be looking for the links and the connections between traditional patterns and today's developments in the region. I think you can now begin to see how these past influences might form a background for the present-day social practices. And in the same way, this course will form a basis or background for second and third year courses, with their focus on the modern period and in particular, the economic and political situation of the region. So, that's the outline of the course. I'd like to go on now to look at what you have to do, your assignments and so on. That is the end of part four.
Hi, this is Alt Bob. I would very much appreciate it if you could like, subscribe and share this video, as this will enable me to help more Alt students reach their Alt goals. Very much appreciate it. Thank you.